Okay. <clears throat> Welcome back to our second lecture on BC213, the end times. Thanks for connecting to the class today. This is our second lecture today. We will look at the answer um, questions in the chat, answer these questions, and then move forward. So there's a question here from Elijah. Uh, the church is entrusted with the proclamation of the gospel. So when the church is removed, who takes up the role of the preaching of the gospel on earth in the days of the tribulation? So what we can tell Elijah first is there's a lot of material that we are creating right now. You know, just imagine, just try to imagine, there are going to be all of these websites with all of these videos, lots of videos on YouTube and so many other places, or websites that are going to be tons of books and Bibles and lots and lots and lots and lots of resources that are going to be left behind, which are going to be telling people, hey, this is what the Bible said is going to happen. So that is one witness that will be on the earth even after the church is taken out of the way. Secondly, uh, like we said, there will be people who will turn to faith in Christ during the tribulation. You know, people are gonna, hey, the rapture is gonna happen. We're all gone. Obviously people, it's gonna be such a, you know, in one way, it's going to be a very catastrophic event because, you know, imagine believers just taken out. Uh, there will be offices that are vacant. It just, just, it'll be catastrophic globally. And uh, that news is going to be going on. It's going to be like the headline news for, I don't know, days or weeks. And it's going to cause people to turn to the Lord. You know, that itself is going to be a big sign. People are going to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, there'll be some who will not, as we will see. Uh, Revelation, uh, I think, chapter 8 says, you know, there will, some will just not turn to the Lord. But then there will be many who will turn to the Lord. So they are going to be preachers of the gospel. That means they're going to tell others, hey, uh, this is what the Bible was saying all along. We didn't believe it. Now it's time to believe it. And so they themselves, the people who turn to the Lord, are seeing all these things happen. Maybe, you know, you and I witness to some people today, they don't believe us. But after the rapture, they're going to turn to Jesus. They're going to go to their Bibles. They're going to, you know, listen to all the things online, read the books, and they're going to turn to the Lord. And they're going to be preachers of the gospel, right? That's second. Third, God is specifically handpicking 144,000 Jewish people, uh, which we will see in Revelation chapter 7. And they will, through part of the tribulation, from Revelation 7 all the way to Revelation 14, be preachers of the gospel. So these people are going to be anointed. It doesn't mean they will all be in Jerusalem. They will be 144,000 Jews all over the world who are handpicked by God anointed by the Holy Spirit, who will be proclamation, proclaimers of the gospel. The fourth is, um, and this is very interesting, you read about this, I think, in Revelation 13. Let me look it up. Um, we are going to see, no, sorry, not Revelation 13, but we are going to see in Revelation 14, Revelation 14, we will see that God has... Uh, um, three, three main angels. There are five angels ref referred to in Revelation 14. But three of these angels are announcing things to the earth. They are warning people not to accept the mark of the beast. They are warning people that there's going to be this great collapse of ba Babylon. They are, uh, Revelation 14, 6 says there's an, another angel preaching the everlasting gospel to the people on the earth. This is Revelation 14. So this is during the second half of the tribulation. We are going to see three angelic messengers proclaiming the gospel, warning the people about the fall of uh, 
Babylon and warning the people not to accept the mark of the beast. So God is going to have them also involved. So, you know, you, we will have basically, there are going to be many witnesses. One, the resources that we leave behind. Two, the people who are saved during the tribulation. Three, the 144,000 Jews. And fourth, these angelic messengers that we read about in Revelation 14 will all be proclaiming the gospel during the tribulation. Okay. Any other questions before we... Okay, Pastor, thank you. And uh, as a follow-up question. Follow -up question. Mm -hmm. So then the follow-up question is, would it be right to suggest that since the church will not be present on the earth during the times of the tribulation, the Holy Spirit will also not be present because the Holy Spirit is present in us believers? So like what we are saying is there are going to be believers in the, new, uh, in the tribulation. And uh, they cannot be believers. They cannot be believers without the Holy Spirit. Right? You cannot be born again with the Holy, without the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has to be on the earth. Second, we said because of Joel's prophecy, Joel prophesied, Joel chapter 2, 28, 29, that the Holy Spirit will continue to be out pour, poured out on the earth during the tribulation, during the times when the sun will be dark and the moon will be blood red, and then God will show signs in the heavens above and the earth beneath, so that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will continue. Thirdly, uh, we talked about you know, the 144,000 Jews being specially sealed. And part of the New Testament seal is the presence of the Holy Spirit and the name of the Lord. Fourthly, we also said that, um, yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah. Fourthly, we also said that, um, what was I saying? Um, we said uh, Zechariah 12, 10, when, uh, when the Lord returns, he, the Spirit of grace and supplication will be poured out on the Jewish people. So for all these reasons, we are saying the Holy Spirit will be continuing on the earth uh, through the tribulation. Okay. And I see also Devia's comment that the two witnesses will be proclaiming the gospel. Yes, that is true. I, I missed that out. So from Revelation chapter 11 onwards, Revelation chapter 11 has information on the two witnesses and they will continue from the middle of the tribulation till towards the end of the tribulation. So they will also be proclaiming mm, the gospel of Jesus with mighty signs and wonders. Yeah. Please, can I ask uh, another question, please? Go ahead, go ahead. Um, with the, um, the, the eternal gospel that will be proclaimed by, by the angels, by the three angels, mm -hmm. um, Presently, our salvation is based on our faith in Christ and after how we live our life. So when you come to faith in Christ, it is expected that you live a righteous, godly life yeah, to, to have the, that full assurance of salvation. Um, mm. Will that be different from the case of the new believers that will come up in the course of the tribulation? Will there be only faith in Christ, or it's, it will matter also how they live their life after their faith, their confession of faith in Christ? Yes, it will matter. Yes. That, you know, so it's the same. Um, it's the same. Uh, so, salve, so, you know, a person cannot, so in the tribulation, a person cannot say, I believe in Jesus and then accept the mark of the beast. It will not work. Because whoever accepts the mark of the beast will not uh, be saved. So a person accepts Christ, stands for Christ, refuses the mark of the beast. They may be mart martyred. They may lose their life in other ways, but that's the testimony, right? And 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 we will see, and you see in Revelation that many people will die for their faith in Christ, you know, for uh, them refusing the mark of the beast. So the answer to the question is, it's the same. We have to believe in Christ and live for Christ. Okay, Pastor, thank you very much. Okay. 
All right, I see another question here from Abhinash. What about 144? Are they, will they also die for the sake of the gospel during tribulation or God's protection will be there in them till the end of the tribulation? So about the 144,000 Jews, what we know is they start their ministry in Revelation chapter seven, which is before the middle of the tribulation. So a, a, a nice way to know uh, the middle of the tribulation is Revelation chapter 11. Right? So Revelation chapter 11, is the middle of the tribulation. Chapter 11, verse one, it's the middle of the tribulation. So everything before that is the first half of the tribulation. So Revelation seven talks about 144,000 Jews. Now in Revelation 14, you see the 144,000 Jews in heaven. But the Bible doesn't tell us how these people got to heaven. How do they get to heaven? So that is a question mark. So when we look at the text, Revelation 14, very carefully, of course, there are the one of two ways they could get to heaven. Either they could have been raptured, taken to heaven, or maybe they were all killed. And then we are seeing their spirits in heaven. So we don't know for sure, based on Revelation 14. In Revelation 14, a word is used that they are the first fruits. They are first fruits, Revelation 14. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and they were under 44 redeemed from the earth. They were the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits, right? So, so that seems to give us a key that it's possible because of the use of the word first fruits. That again, I'm only saying it's possible. It's not, you know, absolutely certain that. They were killed and they were resurrected in the middle, I mean, in that, in Revelation 14, so which is after the middle of the tribulation. So that word, you know, this is Revelation 14 and verse four, um, they were redeemed from the earth, the 144,000 Jews. They're standing before the throne of God, but it doesn't say how it got, how they got there, but this, for being first fruits to God. The word first fruits is often used of that born again experience or death and resurrection experience. So therefore, uh, we, you know, I would say we think, we, I'm not saying we know it for sure, but we think that maybe they were killed or martyred and they were raised up and taken into heaven, maybe, uh, but we're not sure. Okay, and that Revelation 14 happens before the end of the tribulation and before the battle of Armageddon and everything, Revelation 14 happens, okay? All right, we have two more questions. Uh, Shri Kumar and, uh, oh, sorry, I meant, let me see who raised their hands first here. Uh, Christopher and then Shri Kumar, please. Can I ask? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, in uh, <clears throat> like uh, the mark of the beast, as it is more popular, I don't know, most of the preacher preach, but why it is uh, the the seal of God, which is mentioned in Revelation uh, seven and um, and in the Revelation nine, which is mentioned, it is not preached. And uh, my another question is, like the is this seal of uh, God is only given to the the servants of our God, or is it going to give to every everyone who is going to come to Christ at that point of time? Because as it is written in Revelation seven three that this it will be sealed to the servants of our God. So is it for every believers, or this seal will be which is going to give by uh, angels on the forehead? It is for everyone. Thank you. Mm. Um. 
So your first question, why are people preaching more about the mark of the beast yes. than the seal on, on the believers? Um, maybe, you know, I, I, I don't know the answer, but I'm just <laughs> guessing. Um, maybe, uh, you know, the mark of the beast is more, uh, what to say, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's more... Uh, Uh, I can't get the right word. Uh, it's more catchy. I mean, it's, it, it, it gets attention, gets the people's attention. Yeah, so, because it's more scary. Uh, more style or whatever, you know, it's, 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 it gets people's attention. But as Mark of the Beast, I mean, the, the seal of God on the believers may not be so attractive. I, I don't know, I'm just guessing. But the second question, um, the answer to your second question is, the, in the book of Revelation, uh, here it tells us very clearly that these 144,000 Jews have the seal of God. But we know that the seal, like I said, uh, like we mentioned earlier, it, it refers to the presence of the Holy Spirit and the name of God. And actually in Revelation 3, uh, one of the blessings uh, to the overcomer, uh, uh, this is Revelation 3 and verse 12, to the overcomer, God, the Lord Jesus says, I will put my name on you, the name of my God on you, Revelation 3, 12. So which, which means that every believer, every overcomer has this. And today you and I have the seal of God, right? That's Ephesians 1. Ephesians 4, we have the seal, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit. So to answer your question, it is explicitly stated that the 144,000 Jews will be sealed or marked by God. But we can infer, though it's not stated in Scripture, we can infer that every believer in the during the tribulation will have the Holy Spirit in their lives. They'll have the name of Jesus in their lips which is the mark of God on their lives. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's what keeps them through and, and many of them will be martyred. So to answer your question, every believer will have it, but it's specifically stated about these 144,000 Jews uh, because God is going to do a work through the Jewish people during the tribulation for the sake of the gospel and the kingdom of God. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Last question, Christopher, please. Uh, yes, Pastor, I, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, um, um, you may have already answered it, but uh, uh, those who are uh, who are part of the tribulation and who, are, who become believers, um, and they are, they are martyred or you know they um, uh, you know they die, uh, do they do they automatically get um, glorified bodies so uh, you know when they when they go to uh, when they go to heaven so that is my first question and the second question is about um, uh, while the while we are waiting for the rapture um, you know the evil one and, and the evil spirits are uh, you know are obviously you know uh, you know being um, you know in quotes uh, more aggressive in you know in their in their activities and uh, not that we want to you know sort of focus on that as as believers but more from a point of view of the of the of the signs of the times uh, do you see any any sort of uh, um, change in in the way they are they have they have uh, the, the evil one is, is operating uh, which gives us an indication that you know that the end times is even more you know closer than we probably think it is um and in in that in that sort of uh, uh, you know uh, sequence of, of events um is there, is is there an indication on you know the activity of the of the evil one this part in this in this kind of uh, uh, you know uh, aspect of of the sequence and uh, has there been a change in how how they are how they are, they are actually operating versus what how they they were operating before so those are the two questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, the answer to your first question, uh, Revelation chapter 20, uh, verses 4 through 6, 
Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6 says that those who were killed during the tribulation, they will receive their glorified bodies or they will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation. So when they, when they are martyred during the tribulation or killed during the tribulation, their spirits will go up to the Lord and we see them worshiping God in heaven. But they will receive their glorified bodies according to Revelation 20 verses 4 through 7, uh, 4 through 6, at the end of the tribulation. That is, there will be a like a mass resurrection of all those who were killed during the tribulation when Christ comes there in Revelation 20. The second, to answer your second question, I think the biggest thing, which even the Apostle Paul pointed out, like we mentioned in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 3, and what Jesus mentioned in Matthew 24, is that there will be great deception in, in relation to the church in the last days, or just prior to the coming of the Lord, great deception. And if, you know, this is just my observation, I'm not saying this is, you know, uh, some great thing, but my observation is that there has, there has been and is upon the church today a big, a great deception. Especially, I would say, in the last, you know, four or five years. And I've been shocked, I've been shocked that uh, even ministers of God that I, you know, I thought, wow, mm, you know, and again, I'm not trying to say this in any, in any demeaning way, but the fact is in the last four or five years, we've seen the church, and I say church, I mean the body of Christ globally. And in a very sad way, the focus has shifted from the word of God, from the gospel of Jesus Christ, from, you know, the, the simplicity of the truth to focus on things that don't matter. Whether it is political agendas and other things. Like the church is not here for politics. The church is not here to, for those kinds of things, you know. The church is here for the word of God, for the gospel of Jesus, to save souls and to, to portray Christ to the world, to save a lost world. But in the last four or five years, there's been such a shift. And this deception has brought a great division in the body of Christ. So Satan has succeeded in deceiving the church. The result is division in the church, the body of Christ. And the church is fighting about all sorts of silly things. It's like, why does that even matter? You know, and uh, you will find people spending hours and hours writing books and spending hours and hours of airtime, whether on television or other things, focused on this huge distraction which is essentially a deception. So if you ask me, yeah, just to be very brief, um, yeah, it's very sad to see that this is what has happened. It is happening before our eyes. And sometimes I feel like crying. I say like, what's happening? You know, but it's happening before our eyes. And uh, it's sad. But the Bible warns us about this. So, um, yeah, all we have to do is uh, stay true to the word of God and the gospel of Jesus. Okay, um, last question here. What about those who die naturally during the tribulation? Yeah, they will all be raised up. And they will all, all those who die in Christ during the tribulation will receive resurrected bodies at the end of the tribulation. So they will join the believers who've been raptured earlier. Okay. So good questions. Let's go back to our notes. Let's make progress. Let's try to finish this before the rapture happens. Okay. Number five. All right. So 
Um, why do we say that the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation? Fifth reason, because of the chronology of the book of Revelation. Now again here, I, I just want to prefix what I'm saying that there are people who look at the book of Revelation in different ways. Okay, so if you go online and you begin to, you know, read online or read books and all that, you'll find people who just play around with the book of Revelation and did you just find, I don't know, maybe just so many different ways people handle the book of Revelation. But what I want to present to you and suggest to us is that the book of Revelation is you know, you just take it in a chronological order. And I will explain why, and we will go through an overview of the book of Revelation, just maybe next week, we will start it. Take it in the chronological order, the way it is given. And basically, in chapter one, uh, verse 19, the Lord tells John, I want to talk to you about things which you have seen, that is whatever he wrote in chapter one, Things which are, that means things that were happening in John's time, which is chapters 2 and 3. And the things which will take place. That means things are going to come. So very clearly, the book of Revelation is immediately broken into three parts. One is things which you have seen, that is chapter 1. Things which are, which is chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches. and things which will take place after this, things going to come, right? past, present, future, which means that is chapters 4 to 22. So very clear. So it's very clear that chapters 4 to 22 are speaking about future, like what John is looking into the future because chapter one is what he has seen. Two and three is what is happening. It was happening during John's time. So the seven churches existed during John's time. And it was a message to each of the seven churches. And then chapters four to 22 is in the future. So break it like that. Now, uh, I know that there are variations right here. People don't do it like that. Okay, so I'm, I'm giving you uh, my, uh, you know, my, my, uh, you know, my break, break up of the book of Revelation just based on this verse, right? And, and there are others who agree, of course, with this view, but there will be people who differ, right? Some people, example, some people uh, look at the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 as seven church ages, and um, therefore the, the seventh church is representing today's church age. But uh, truly, that is not what, what Jesus said. He said, things which are. So that means these are the seven churches. Now, I'm not going to fight with people who, you know, make the seven churches represent seven church ages. I mean, if they want to do it, okay, I'm not fighting with them. But I don't think that's right because those seven churches existed in John's time, and Jesus was talking about things which are. Those were the things that were at that time. Okay, it's all right. So people have different views, and that's one example of a of a differing view. Okay, but so you start from chapter four. Chapter four and five are a picture of believers in heaven. And you say, well, basically in chapter four and five, it's the scene of the throne room. You have God the Father seated on the throne. You have the Lamb of God, that is Jesus Christ. You have the seven spirits, which is the Holy Spirit. He's represented there by the seven lamps of fire, the uh, seven horns and the seven eyes representing his uh, omnipresence, his omnipotence, and his omniscience. And then you have the 24 elders. 
Now, what about the 24 elders? Well, we know that these 24 elders are believers who've been redeemed. So how do you know that? Well, so many things. First of all, they're all wearing white robes. The only people who are wearing white robes in the book of Revelation are believers who've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Second, they have crowns. The only people who are wearing crowns are the believers who receive their rewards. Thirdly, they're sitting on thrones. The only people other than God himself who are seated on the throne are believers. And Jesus told the 12 apostles, you know, when I come into my kingdom, each of you will have a throne and you'll be seated with me. So the 12 are the 12 apostles. The other 12 are probably the 12 leaders from the Old Testament. And then you also look in Revelation 20, you know that uh, in the New Jerusalem, the 12 gates are named after 12 tribes and the 12 apostles of the Lamb are the 12 foundations of the new city of Jerusalem. So they're honored that way, then therefore they're also honored by being seated, 12 apostles, 12 elders from the Old Testament, they're all. And then finally in Revelation 19, uh, one of the elders who speaks to John tells John, John, I am of your own brethren. So one of the elders, if one of the elders is a Jewish brethren of John, then the rest of the elders are also them and they're probably the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So it is very clear that this scene of Revelation 4 and 5 is a scene of believers who are being raptured. They are before the throne and they are worshiping God and they have received their rewards and, and that's the scene. And at that moment, the Lamb of God opens the scroll with seven seals. The word seven, number seven simply means perfect. So perfection, seven seals. I mean, this has been perfectly closed till that moment. So at that moment, he opens a seal, which is symbolic of these events are going to start taking place now. And then chapter six, verse one, as soon as the lamp opens the scroll, the events start taking place. Okay, so chapter four and five, if you understand the, uh, the, the imagery, the prophetic imagery, the meaning is very simple, it's very beautiful. The scroll has been sealed up until that time. Daniel chapter 12, the angel told Daniel, Daniel, these prophecies will be sealed till the end of time. The only, and when the seals have seven seals, that means perfectly sealed. The only one who could open the scroll is the lamp of God. So Jesus says, time for these things to begin to happen. Chapter six, verse one, you see the man coming riding on a white horse. That's the antichrist. Okay, so, so the chronology of the book of Revelation is very simple. Chapters four and five, believers are in heaven. They receive their rewards. The scroll is opened. Chapter six, down here on earth, big tribulation starts. And it goes all the way till chapter 20 when the battle of Armageddon takes place. So if you just look at Revelation chronologically, we can understand the rapture happens, then tribulation starts on the earth. Okay. Um, one last one. I think I've mentioned this before. Uh, Daniel's 70th week is for Israel, not the church. So I think we studied this passage. Um, uh, so when we looked at Daniel chapter 9, uh, the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel. He says, Daniel, 70 weeks are determined for your people and your holy city. So he says, I'm going to talk to you about 70 weeks. And uh, we know that these 70 weeks are, you know, each week represents a period of seven years. This is a total of 490 years. But he says, this is about your people and your holy city. So there's no, the church is not involved here, right? It's all about what's going to happen concerning Israel and Jerusalem. Right, so uh, the seventieth week, which is that last seven-year period, where the Antichrist, this is verse twenty-seven, where he confirms a covenant for one week. That means he sets up a you know a treaty of peace for one week. That seven years 
is has to do with the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem, not the church. So the church is taken out of the way and everything on the earth now begins to affect Israel and Jerusalem. Of course, the gospel is being preached and of course people are getting saved, but uh, the whole climax of events is being focused on Israel and Jerusalem and the Antichrist is gonna be doing all of these things. Okay, so these are the six high level points or reasons why we believe that, you know, the church is taken out of the way before the tribulation and it's not going through the um, seven, uh, seven years of tribulation. Okay, now, uh, and just a few more questions, just run through a few things and then I'll take up questions is, um, let's say, uh, here's a question, you know, who will be raised from the dead at the time of the rapture? Will we meet Old Testament saints raised up in Ephesians 4? So the question is, will Old Testament saints also be part of the rapture, right? And so I just answer that here and I say, yes, all of us, that means every person who's died and who's in heaven with Jesus, the Old Testament saints are with Jesus right now because when Christ ascended, he took them there. And they are there. And then all who have died in Christ are also there. They will receive their resurrected bodies in the rapture. Now, here again, there is a difference of opinion, meaning there are those of us, like myself and others, who believe that Old Testament saints will be part of the rapture. That means they will receive the resurrected bodies at that time. There are those who believe that Old Testament saints will receive the resurrected bodies at the end of the tribulation. Fine. Okay, we're not going to argue about it. Uh, I just give you reasons as to why um, uh, why we believe that Old Testament saints will receive, uh, you know, uh, the resurrected bodies at the rapture. Simply one main reason is now they are there with Jesus in Christ. Uh, they are part of the family of God. And secondly, uh, they without the church, or let's say, uh, they will be perfected together with the church. You know, uh, that's in Hebrews 11. So they shall not be made perfect apart from us. So God kept that, you know, has kind of put everything on hold so that we can be perfected together. So uh, if that was his whole plan from the very beginning, why would he leave them out of the rapture when the church receive, when the saints receive uh, the resurrected bodies, right? So that's one. And um, uh, they are also part of the church. Uh, uh, we see this in Hebrews 12. It includes the spirits of just men. You know, this is in Hebrews 12. So the church um, mentioned in Hebrews 12, the church of the firstborn, the heavenly Jerusalem includes Old Testament saints, the spirits of just men, right? And Ephesians 3, Paul refers to the whole family in heaven and earth. That means that includes Old Testament saints. So we're just looking at all of these three verses. You know, they are part of the family of God. They are in Christ. And therefore, we say they will receive their resurrected bodies uh, along with uh, the New Testament saints. Uh, who will be taken up in rapture. Um, I think Sri Kumar has asked this question before. So, you know, rapture ready, those who are ready. Uh, but, you know, salvation is by grace. And uh, again, I, so I, I just make this comment there that uh, if they are saved, they're ready. But uh, who's, who's going to be left behind? We will leave that to the Lord. Uh, we understand we have to live ready for the rapture and uh, will we recognize each other in heaven? Yes, we will know even as we are known, okay? So I'll pause here, we'll pick this up from next week. So next week, what we're gonna do is um, this Daniel 70th week, I think I've spoken to you about it a few times. Here is the explanation of those that 70th week. But what we're gonna do uh, from next week is we're gonna get into the book of Revelation and we'll use the book of Revelation as a chrono chronological timeline to see 
the different things are going to take place, right? So we will start off in the book of Revelation, starting from uh, chapter one, uh, uh, and we will track all of this. Let me go back to the chart at the top. Uh, yeah, so we will track from here all the way here using the book of Revelation as a chronological guide, right? So like what we said was chapter one, two and three is over here. Chapter four starts off here with the rapture. Four and five is talking about things in heaven. Chapter six onwards goes on from here. So we will track chapter six all the way to chapter 20 till here. It tells us what's gonna happen here. Then chapter 21, chapter 20 covers this whole millennium period till here. Chapters 21, 22 go into new heavens and new earth. So that's how we're gonna track the sequence of events. Okay, so um, we will do that next week. All right, let me just pick up these things, uh, the questions in, um, in the chat. Elisha, based on what we have discussed so far then, the rapture is not the second coming of Christ, but an event leading to the second coming of Christ. Is that right? Um, yes, we could put it that way. Uh, some people call the rapture, refer to the rapture as a secret coming of Christ because he's coming for the church. And the actual, the second coming, when he actually comes back and lands his feet on Mount Olivet is in Revelation 20, when that is referred to as the second coming of Christ. So, yes. Um, Christopher, please exp explain Hades, Shoal, and Paradise in more detail. Okay, so um, Shoal and Hades, Shoal is the Hebrew word, Hades is the Greek word to refer to um, hell, um, the place where people who die go. Uh, now, so Sheol and Hades refer to the same place. Sheol is the Hebrew and Hades is the Greek. Now, there were two compartments in Sheol, Hades, Sheol or Hades or the place where people went. There was the place of, um, there was a place called Paradise that um, also was known as Abraham's bosom. And then there was a place of torment, or we could refer to it as hell. This was before the cross in the Old Testament. After the cross, after the resurrection, Paradise or Abraham's bosom was moved out of being part of Hades and taken up into heaven. So you read about that in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, I think, Revelation 2, 10, where we see that paradise is actually in heaven. So Revelation 2, 7, sorry. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, and also in... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. So paradise is up in heaven. It used to be before the cross, it used to be place under the earth, separate from hell, where the Old Testament saints were temporarily held. But when Christ, after his resurrection, when he ascended, he took paradise up into heaven. So all the Old Testament saints are in heaven. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, Elisha's question, did Jesus descend into hell for what purpose? Yes, he descended into hell uh, which Jesus said, you know, today you'll be with me in paradise. And at that time, paradise was part of Hades. 
hell. So he went down there. Uh, two reasons, I mean, I can think of immediately. One is because, you know, that's the complete price. We were going to be there. He went down there for our sake. Secondly, um, both Peter and uh, and Peter and Jude, I think, uh, both refer that Jesus went and announced to the spirits that who were held in prison that you know the work he was going to do. So he proclaimed in hell uh, what he was doing not for their salvation, but to announce that redemption has been made available. And having descended to hell, he came out triumphant. He conquered hell, the grave. Revelation 1, he has the keys of Hades and of the grave, death. So he rose up triumphant. So he had to do that to conquer every enemy, everything that overcame man because of the fall, which included hell and death. So he conquered everything. So that was the complete redemption. Okay. It's paradise called the third heaven, which is the first and second. Um, well, yeah, the Bible talks about the third heaven. Paradise is in the third heavens. Now, the first and the second heaven the way we understand it, and, I'm, and I, I, we can't prove this from chapter and verse, but the way we understand it is, or when I say we, it means generally understood. The first heavens is the environment around the earth, or we could refer to it as the atmospheric heaven. The clouds, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows his handiwork. So that's the first heaven. The second heaven is the invisible heavens where demonic spirits operate. So we talk about this in the heavenlies. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits of darkness in the heavenly. So that's the second heaven. It's actually the spiritual heaven that is different from the atmospheric or the celest heavens that contain the celestial bodies. So that's the second heaven. It's the heaven where demonic powers operate. And the third heaven is where God dwells, where we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies, in the heavenlies, meaning above the second heaven, in the third heaven where God himself dwells. So atmospheric heaven, second heaven is a spiritual heaven where demonic spirits operate. Third heaven is where God dwells, where we are seated in heavenlies in Christ. It's okay. Okay. All right, so thank you. It was nice. Uh, thank you for asking questions. Um, and it's a uh, time for all of us to learn. Okay, let's um, wrap up. Um, uh, you're all understanding things so far. Uh, any problems? Everybody's okay. You know, I wish we were all in the same classroom. I can see your faces. And I can know that you are following me and you're understanding. Uh, I know I can't see your faces, so I don't know if uh, you are understanding or you're not understanding, but I just trust that, uh, you know, things are clear. Please don't hesitate to ask me to repeat something or uh, if it is not clear, just, um, just tell me. So uh, we could try to explain it better, okay? All right, let's wrap up for today. Somebody could please pray and then we will dismiss. Anyone can pray with us. Okay, I see your comments in the chat. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Somebody could pray and then we will dismiss. Yeah. Pastor, can I pray? Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Shri, Shri Precious Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this wonderful day which you have given to us, oh, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord Master speaking through you, servant. I thank you, Father God, that you are strengthening him. Oh, Lord Master bringing the revelation from your word, Father God. I know that, Father, this is from the, from Lord Master, this is from you. And Father, every word what, Lord Master, what we received today, 
let it be secure in our heart and let it bring edification of our spirit of God so that we can prepare ourselves for Lord Master and we can walk with that full holiness and Father God we can able to fulfill the plan of God on this earth of God. Thank you once again, Father God, for giving us this opportunity to come together and listen mm -hmm. to your word, O oh Lord Master. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank Amen. You, Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. I'll see you all tomorrow morning. God bless. Have a good day. Bye now. Uh, thank you.